So you were named after the God who wrote the dictionary. <laughs> well, there are two things about that. First, my mother's name before she married my father was Daniel. Uh, he knew when she got married, whatever the son she might have, she was going to name it with Daniel. And that's how I got it, even though she married a witch. <laughs> <laughs> so they the family name, but neither am I named for the historical volume who tried over 200 cases before the Supreme Court, who was the U.S. Secretary of State under three presidents, was a member of the House of Representatives, and a member of the Senate. That was Daniel Webster. I am not named to be. But even if I were, Daniel Webster did not write to the new team. No Webster. I knew all that, but I got in a bit of trouble correcting. <laughs> And so I made the statement saying, not knowing that the 34 kids in my class, yes, there were 35, the 34 kids in my class were sure I had been named after the guy who wrote the dictionary. And for the rest of my time in that school, I was Dictionary Webster. That was my nickname, Dictionary, Dictionary, pretty much on the ball court, on the field. In the classroom, I was Dictionary Webster. Um, it would stick until we moved away from that side of town. But that wasn't that bad a name. I loved words. I started reading early and was quickly reading above my grade level. Um, in my classes, we would have weekly spelling bees. And I would win about four out of five of the times. I still remember the day I got knocked out of the round that would determine who would compete in our school spelling event and go on to Washington, D.C. I was cocky. And the word gnaw, as in gnaw a bone, the three people before me misspelled it. And I cockily said K-N-A-W. <laughs> And as soon as I said it, I knew it was G and I do. And I popped out of the spelling bee. Still, still, I still remember that word. I love to read. I love new words. I love spelling. And so dictionary was not a bad name for me. I still love to read. I'm still a pretty good proofreader, uh, especially for spelling and word usage. So language, words, communication were all critical concepts for me and how I understood myself. So that's the first part of my introduction. Words are important to me. Second part of my introduction, talking about kinds of words. I grew up in church. The Christian Church Disciples of Christ is the denomination I grew up in, generally considered to be slightly on the liberal side of mainline Protestantism. The Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ have been like this for a number of decades. We actually share boards together. And if you know, um, how many of you know Vince Amlin? How many of you know the church, Gilead, that he is starting? How many of you know Rebecca, who is the co-pastor there? Rebecca is Disciples of Christ. That church is actually both United Church of Christ and Disciples of Christ. I grew up in the other one. Um, it was relatively easy for me to make that shift coming out of the Disciples background to UCC, except for one thing. I do miss weekly communion. I grew up with that. And all of August and the last of July, I was preaching in disciples' churches and had communion and realized I kind of miss that. 
I grew up in the church to tell you, to, to set the stage for this. I loved words of all kinds, but I truly came to appreciate, be challenged, and love what I would have called church words in high school. Late in high school, I began to be serious about my faith. I'll come back to that word later, uh, the word faith. I wanted answers. I wanted answers to my questions. I wanted solid answers, black and white answers. This is the way it is answers. And my church didn't have them. I wanted that and I wasn't getting it. And so I began to look elsewhere and I began to think I was finding answers in young life. Many of you are familiar with young life. I slowly but surely left the mainline denomination and made the shift into 1970s evangelicalism. I grew up in suburbia, upper middle class. Evangelicalism seemed to be tailor-made for somebody from my privileged background. It was. I liked the firm certainty and answers that seemed to come from that camp. I would go off to college, grow my hair long, long. Nobody believes that, but Nell has actually seen it. <laughs> and my beard long. Uh, and thus weird beard. And then just weird. Um, still evangelical. While I was at school, I was labeled a Jesus freak. Fit. I was comfortable with that. Um, and when I came back for, to my hometown for the rest of my college career, I was recruited to be a young life leader. I was assigned to one high school where there had not been a group before. And almost all the kids who would be part of my group lived in housing projects. Very different from where I grew up on the other side of town. It was a grand experiment. They were calling it the ghetto group, the Young Life ghetto group. Um, Young Life had primarily focused on the economically better off schools, and I was to be part of something different. The kids in my group dealt with issues related to poverty and family dysfunction. Almost all of the guys in my group had used or were currently using drugs, at least huffing paint. And almost all had spent some time in reform school for various offenses. Many of the girls understood that they would not be understood to be women until they had a baby. And some of them had gotten pregnant as young as 11 years old, having their babies at age 12. Mine was and probably still is the only young life group I've ever heard of where breastfeeding and toddlers were welcome. One thing I learned quickly, while many of what I thought of as church words, which seemed to be a part of my everyday vocabulary, my vernacular for most of my growing up in the places in the church where I had belonged and in my neighborhood, um, there was a kind of a common religious language that just sort of was part of the air that you absorbed being a Southern kid. Like Flannery O'Connor said, some of you will know this quote, I think it's safe to say that while the South is hardly Christ-centered, it is most certainly Christ-haunted. And the language, that Christ-haunted language that sort of permeated Southernism, if you will, people just kind of absorbed that language. That was not true in the housing projects. Church words were a foreign language. Faith, belief, salvation, all those. Uh, and it was my job to teach, if not the words, the concepts behind them in a way that might make some sort of sense. It would be a mistake to say that I was dummying down the concepts. 
Some of the kids weren't well-educated, but neither were they dumb. It was my role to find ways to offer something of God, of Jesus, of faith, there's that word again, to young people who were dealing with challenges that were as foreign to me as church and Jesus Christ and gospel were to them. So I needed to know what I meant when it came to some of those church words that rolled so easily off my tongue. And I needed or at least wanted to communicate those concepts to my young life group. And we were getting that. I want you to think about the creativity that you saw this morning. What unusually amazing ways of offering good news through the songs and through the readings. Wow. Well, we were trying to be creative too, and 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 we were we were we were kind of getting there. My team and I, I spent tons of time on street corners in the ghettos and in the projects. And I could spend a whole day telling stories of stuff that happened just on the streets. Guns, seeing two 11-year-old kids steal my car while I wasn't any farther away than you, right in front of me. We can do it. No, you can't. Yes, we can. Bye. My car. Um, but mostly hours and hours of simply being present, building trust and listening and listening and listening. It's a whole different seminar, maybe a sermon, but I am convinced uh, based on something Larry said last week about good news, that what the good news is depends on what the bad news is. And I needed to hear their bad news to see if church language had anything to say to that. My group was growing. We were gathering weekly. I had a Nashville session guitarist volunteered to work with me and he was leading our singing. Man, we had good singing. That guy could play. Um, I usually speak for 10 to 12 minutes, trying to relate to them something from the Bible to their lives and especially how those kids were experiencing their lives in the project. And it turns out that projects weren't all that dissimilar to the experience of first century Palestinian Jews under the thumb of the Roman government. There were things that they were catching and apprehending and wrestling with. My wife says I'm not loud enough, so anytime that happens, just, and I'll speak louder. Um, but we were growing and something was happening in those projects. It was an exciting time. And, and that's when a group of rich fundamentalists took over the board of the local Young Life group. They began to dictate how groups were to be run and what could be taught and would be taught and how it would be taught. Every group leader was then asked to sign a statement of faith and a purity code. The five fundamentals that they wanted me to sign off on, saying, I believe, and we're getting to that word. The five fundamentals of Christian belief identified as fundamentals in 1910 are biblical inspiration, biblical infallibility, the virgin birth of Jesus, belief that Jesus' death was atonement for sin and the bodily resurrection. I believe, one, two, three, four, five. They added a couple of others. Um, the statement that was before me was to affirm all of those five things plus additions, like not accepting evolution. Um, and I would pledge not to smoke. I was going to have to stop. Drink, 
do drugs, have sex outside of marriage, not cuss. Going to have to learn to stop to do that. Still have it. And to be a good patriotic American as they understood that, meaning I would support Nixon in the war in Vietnam. I was already and still am a pacifist. Much like the United Church of Christ, my disciples' denomination had in its earliest days a slogan. Part of it began this way, no creed but Christ. No creed but Christ. We were acredal. There's another religious vocabulary word for you. We were acredal, as is true of the United Church of Christ. I guess that took... What they were asking me to do was sign a creed. I spent a few days praying about it to be sure, but frankly, there was no way in hell I was going to sign that thing. And if I couldn't sign that, the purity statement was irrelevant because I had to bring both of them. So I got to avoid that. I handed in the form unsigned. I did stop smoking. The paid staff of Young Life asked for my keys to the facility where we had our meetings and essentially disinvited me from Young Life leadership meetings that had been very important to my faith. In some ways, that was my church. Turned out that the board had never liked the way I looked. And they didn't like the creative ways we were trying to teach and get faithful concepts to some of these young kids in the projects in the ghetto. They didn't like that I looked like a Jesus freak, and so they said, good riddance. And the fundamentalists kicked me out of evangelicalism. Another day we can talk about fundamentalists another day we can talk about evangelicalism but that's kind of the deal i got kicked out disfellowshipped if you will and uh y'all have been around me enough to know that sometimes things cross my mind that aren't planned this is one of them i had an old guy in my church in hattiesburg mississippi and i was talking to him one day he was well into his 80s and he said uh he said, Dan, I used to be a Baptist. I said, okay, and now you're a disciple. And he said, yeah, yeah, seemed to fit better. I said, well, what made you leave? He said, well, I got churched. And I thought, we think of getting churched. It's coming to church. He said, no, I got church for attending a frolic. I said, what? He said, I went to a dance and they kicked me out. I grew my hair long. They kicked me out. Um. I thank God that the fundamentalists kicked me out of evangelicalism. <laughs> but they did not divorce me from the desire to communicate religious and spiritual ideas in ways that people can approach understanding them. As I left the evangelical camp, I had to deconstruct my religious understandings and decide whether I was going to let religion go or attempt to reconstruct it. As you might guess, I chose the latter. Um, but what never left me was the desire to communicate understandably matters of faith. And so now we're about to get to the why of this seminar and the reasons that I said yes to trying it. And I hope y'all are putting up with me telling my story. And if you're not, you're still sitting there. So some of you, I know a couple of you got to leave. This might be a good time. John Harvey often asks me when they're looking for somebody to fill one of these seminar spots, he said, do you have something that might interest folks for a seminar? And my answers are usually something like this. Well, I have something that interests me. And you tell me if you think folks would be interested. And we've done several seminars here uh, along the way. This time, John was more specific. He said, would you do something on a couple of words that get used in church and beyond? 
Words? Hey. Dictionary tears is interested. Do I get to pick the words? He said, well, I was hoping you would tackle these two. Belief and faith. Thank you, John. Um, so, not easy words on some level. And I want to go back a little bit. Let's start with belief. And I want to go back to that sheet of paper I was handed where I was to affirm that I believe those five things plus a few more. Let me remind you what they are. Biblical inspiration, believing that God, the word inspiration would mean breathe in, a better word would be biblical expiration. God breathed out the very original words of Scripture. The words are from God. The infallibility of Scripture because of that. It is true historically, scientifically, in every other way. Believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Mary never was with a man. Belief that Christ's death was the atonement for sin. Starting out that we are sinners. That's just kind of understood. Um, believing that Jesus was bodily resurrected from the grave. And believing in the authenticity of the miracles as miracle. I was asked to affirm, to say, I believe in each one of those things. Now, those are statements that one can accept as true. Many evangelicals and all fundamentalists pretty much do, or you can reject them, or you can wonder about them. Maybe they're there to help us wonder. I was being asked to affirm that I believe those things. In this understanding, belief is understood to be an intellectual exercise. It's what you do in your head. You might say it with your mouth, but it's up here. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. It is an intellectual exercise. I accept it as true. It is a statement. And I believe or don't these things. You with me? That's kind of the understanding that uh, has been developed in the last 150 years in some ways. Belief is primarily in our heads. It It is it is more than, than just thinking, but it's primarily mental. These things are true or they're not. Fundamentalists, and there are all sorts of versions, not just Christian, of various kinds want, even demand affirmation of their version of what is fundamental. You hanging with me? If I get too esoteric, um, go... I want to suggest that that understanding is actually the modern one and that we might want to go back and reclaim an older understanding. Um, so, uh, in honor of this morning, I may write each word in a different color. Here's the word we're looking at. Belief. What are we talking about? Well, if we go back to the Saxon original languages that brought us that word that way, it, it simply breaks out into two words. By and life. You know, I stole this. I stole this from another group. I should have left it with them and figured something else out. By life or to flip the words belief by life 
It's what you live by. It's more than an intellectual acknowledgement. It is deeper than that. It is bigger than that. What I believe is what I live by. Um, and so more than intellectual assent or affirmation about statements or tenets, it is better understood to be, oh my gosh, whole person exercise. And I wrote that down before this morning's service, way before. But think about how almost all the pieces tied together, mind, heart, courage, whole person, whole community. So belief is better understood to be a whole of person exercise. In that old understanding, or actually the newer understanding of the fundamentalist, belief comes into being differently. But it is far richer than simply intellectually affirming, however strongly, what one thinks to be true. What you believe is what you live by. It's in the head, yes, but it's in the heart. It's on the tongue. It is seen in what one does and how one lives. Belief is seen and found in actions and attitudes. Not just signing your name to a sheet of paper or saying those words out loud, I believe that. Nothing wrong with doing those things. But that's not really belief in its deepest understanding. I suggest to you that this older, actually more traditional understanding of belief fits far better the approach of progressive religion, including progressive Christianity. And certainly UCG is tied to progressive faith and religion. I want to make a point here that may be helpful or it may piss you off that I say that on Zoom. Um, I've spoken of the way of understanding belief as what I will refer to as traditional Christian fundamentalism, but the approach is really a couple of hundred years old. There are other brands of fundamentalism. We have no problem talking about Islamic fundamentalism. But there's a brand of liberal fundamentalism, too. Things that are expected to be believed and expected to be lived out and understood. And that can be true of current liberal thought, both politically, religious, and culturally. Fundamentalism that kind of understanding of belief sets boundaries. You believe it or you don't. You're in or you're out. A kind of tribalism. Fundamentalism, whether that's its tent, intent or not, determines who's right or wrong, who's one of us, and if you're not fully one of us, you're against us. Gosh, do we see that today? Um, but we also see it in liberalism sometimes. Well, if you don't believe all these things, um, it's a lot easier to see uh, at the extremes. Um, quick story. So, before Nell and I moved here to Florida or back to Florida, um, we lived in Memphis, Tennessee, kind of an interesting place, uh, great music, great barbecue, lots of good stuff. Um, so one day I'm driving from my house to my church and uh, I, it's a big deal in town that the great Isaac Hayes 
Remember? Isaac Hayes has died. And there was a, a church in town, Faith Presbyterian Church, that simply recognized that it was a part of the community and it owed the community things. And when there were big funerals that none of the large Baptist churches would host, they would host it. Didn't matter if you were Presbyterian, didn't matter if you were Christian, Isaac Hayes wasn't. Uh, the chef, won't even go very far with that. Um, South Park, by the way, is where he was the chef. Um, I guess y'all don't watch that. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> know your audience then know your audience um so faith presbyterian church was hosting or, or inviting the community in for isaac hayes's funeral and literally hundreds and thousands of people were there this was the church that would hold about four thousand, and it did and i am driving in i've totally forgotten that i'm going to pass faith presbyterian church um but i am driving by and all of a sudden Without, I think, there's a huge sign. God hates fags. Those people. Westboro Baptist Church, Topeka, Kansas. Um, Isaac Hayes is in hell. This church is of Satan. Isaac Hayes was a Scientologist, and that was in parentheses. Hosting this... Um, that's a particular brand of fundamentalism. On top of the things I just said, uh, uh, these these those folks were called tulip fundamentalists. Anybody ever heard of that? You ever go to the? Yes, you have. You ever go to the Westboro Baptist Church uh, website? You'll find out what. Well, I'm going to tell you what Tulip Baptist Church believes and what it means, or what Tulip fundamentalism is. In addition to those things we've just shared a minute ago, starts with T. Total depravity. Every human being is born not only a sinner, but we're just bad to the bone and beyond. Total depravity. Uh, you won't hear that around here very much. We, we we don't we if we talk about original sin it's to compare it with original blessing and god said it was good very good um total depravity you unconditional election if you are chosen by god to be one of god's people you can't unchoose it no matter what you do in other words predestination actually double pre destination god chooses you you can't unchoose it there's nothing you can do about it three limited atonement god's only going to choose a few everybody else is going to hell and almost all of those few go to westboro baptist church <laughs> i t-u-l-i irresistible grace if you're one of the chosen you know it, you embrace it. You can't reject it. And P, perseverance of the saints, you will live like a saint. You will carry a sign that says, this church is going to hell. That kind of belief is a series of intellectual exercises I think this, it may motivate what you do and what you say and what signs you carry. But at its base, it is primarily an intellectual exercise. Belief, as I am suggesting, the progressive church needs to reclaim from the ancient past is understanding belief to be bigger than that. It's a whole body. It is a mind heart, emotion, body, experience. It is what you live by. You with me? Okay. Um, 
I'm going to stop there for a minute. I may stop there completely. What are your thoughts? What are your questions? What do you want to challenge? Or, or, or where are we? Yes. Hi, I have uh... Oh, hold on, hold on, wait, just a second. Sorry, I forgot about the here. microphone. Okay. I was uh, trying to come up with something. I was trying to come up with the name of the um, individual, and I think his name is Philip Noel. Uh, anyway, I got that wrong. Um, he had something in some a book that he had written. He talked about prayer, and I believe it went, um, the prayers that we say affect uh, the way we live and the way we live affects the prayers that we say. And I thought that was really enlightening for me because a lot of times I just talk about, you know, like religious words, the idea of prayer became like a big confusing cyclone in my head. So I just, I'll just leave it at that. That was a good thing for me to hear. Good. Yeah. One, one of the things as you're passing that along, is how does belief come? Does it come from uh, saying the words until they become a part of us? Or does it happen coming to doing until we also think it? Um, either way, there's not one way that belief comes to us. Yeah. For me, belief it has been experiential. Uh, I'm a big believer in fake it till you make it. And then, yeah, that's how belief has come to me. But that wasn't what I was going to comment on. When you um, mentioned the people holding up signs outside of Isaac Hayes' funeral, um, my bad tendency to kibitz burst forth, oh, those people, which is liberal fundamentalism coming right out of my mouth without my even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. How do I, as a person uh, who practices love, overcome that tendency. I think we all mean to practice love. Um, some people make it harder for us. Uh, I I, uh, I I will go go back to what I talked about a little bit about in the ghetto. Um, staying on the street corner, talking. Listening, listening, listening. Um, I, Nell knows this, and I won't push too far. I don't want you to drive through my neighborhood and guess who this is. But I got a neighbor who likes to drink occasionally, and when he drinks enough and he sees me, he wants to talk about God. And uh, he invariably wants to tell me about God and about things of religion. And he goes to one of the larger uh, evangelical churches here in Gainesville. And so what I realized most of the time is he's telling me what he heard on Sunday. What his preacher said is now what he believes or affirms using that newer understanding. Um, and I used to argue with him. Now I listen and uh, wait and see if we can talk. Um, he is MAGA to the core, in addition to uh, very, very different from me religiously. We listen and we do stuff for each other. Uh, the last hurricane when Neil and I were too dumb to have bought a generator, he brought one over. Um, when something's going on, it looks like he needs four arms instead of just his two. I go over. And uh, we just know we're not going to agree, but uh, we actually tell each other we love each other. And we're trying to live into that. Neither one of us are quite there yet. But we're trying, and I don't know a better way to do it than to listen when you can, to be there when you can, and do when you can. Did that make any sense at all? Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Ellen. 
By the way, nobody has to agree with me. Well, I would say I agree with you. Okay. So when we lived up north and... There was a high school that was a whopping block and a half from our house, private high school, which, you know, I had been homeschooling myself, long story. But anyway, we were applying for my son to go to this high school. So that I was in seminary. I wouldn't have to drive him all over kingdom come. And they had a list of things I had to sign, a belief statement, very similar to the one you were dealing with, because it was a very dare I say, I don't know if you've ever heard of Wheaton College. This yep. this was the feeder school to Wheaton College. And I looked at this and I thought, I can't affirm these. So I crossed out all sorts of them, like the inerrancy of scripture, things like that. I was in seminary and then I signed it. And they said, well, you know, what we're really asking is for you to respect, and we're asking for your son to respect what's being said. And I said, that we can affirm. And it was a good experience. Yeah. Um, when I was asked to sign that, that those two, two different things, it was an in or an out thing. It, it, was, it was not asking me to respect. It was, yeah. Um, yeah, we had a bit of an experience like that. When I was in seminary, Nell taught at a, a conservative Christian college. And uh, because she came in quarter time, she was not required to sign their statement of faith. And the next year they made her half time. And the next year they made her full time and they forgot she never signed the thing. And she didn't remind them. Um, because in good conscience, she could respect what was going on there without me. Both of us could, she couldn't sign that thing. So I don't know if that's cheating or not. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the time and thinking I am not going to tackle my second word. Uh, the other word John wanted me to look at is faith. Um, I actually came up with a list of about 30 words that might be interesting over a long period of time to play with. As this said, uh, part one, it could happen again or it may never happen again. It depends on the seminar committee and if I'm invited. But I will play with words with you if you would like to. We'll go there. Yes, Chad. Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. I dressed up for the seminar, seminar, actually. So the one thing I want to want to say is I think there is a distinction and it's worth noting about like this, this fundamentalism or like this, like the Westboro Baptist. And I think that there's, there's a huge distinction between seeing something like that protesting a funeral like the disrespect that's being shown to people and to a community of people in a moment like that just because we're appalled just because we understand like oh those folks are like crazy like doesn't necessarily mean that we are leaning into liberal fundamentalism i think there's a distinction between you know, even like the conversation, that's that's a very healthy way, like having a neighbor acting in love, sharing with one another, like, you know, they leave, go out of town, you like go pick up their mail, you know, like you can still be in relationship with people and you can still act lovingly to people. But there's also there is a need to recognize hate and recognize things that feed on and are disrespectful of other people and i think that there is a line that's that has to be drawn and so like us labeling them so to speak might not be the way but i definitely think that there's there's a place for us to recognize the extremism and 
the realities are we might not find our ways to have relationships with people that might find a safe haven in a Westboro Baptist. But there's lots and lots of variety of folks that we can have relationships with. And we probably do have opportunities to have relationships with. And how do we act in those moments? Like when we have the real situations and not these situations where there are people protesting things that, and just showing just hate and disrespect in society. So I think I just feel like I want to say that maybe I'm maybe I'm just this crazy raging liberal over here but you know you know and I will say too the ironic piece of this is Baptists are also non-credal people. But back in the 70s like when Leung Life was taking over, that was happening at the same time to the Southern Baptist Convention. And the Southern Baptist Convention was also being taken over. And truthfully, if you want to look at the historical nature of things, you could probably trace a lot of the, the, the MAGA ideas today, and you can trace them back to the, that period of time when this stuff was starting to happen in these smaller local evangelical religious communities that was like the test case in some ways of this grander scale that has grown into a, a very large political realm but but baptists specifically historically have not been creedal but you know back during that time they rewrote the baptist faith and message and then they required people to sign it and then if you didn't sign it they fired you from their from the seminaries and so they purged a lot of the progressive thinkers within Baptist life, they purged them and the Baptists have been dispersed throughout lots of different denominations. So it's ironic to me. A lot of it's just irony where I sit here and I'm just like, you know, Baptist, man, you know, but, uh, you know, it's funny to me. I was, and I, yeah. And, you know, like it's, you know, these things are drilled deep. So, but that's all I got to say. Uh, thanks, Quick man. word. Um, the way I approached this uh, kind of came from a poet named Kathleen Norris. Some of you may have uh, encountered her in other books. This one's called Amazing Grace, A Vocabulary of Faith. Uh, these are not poetry. She sometimes intersperses, but they're uh, vignettes about words. Um, so uh, you might get the word faith. And uh, a thing. she starts with uh, eschatology. And the second one is Antichrist. And I'm going, uh, how did I get past this to get to the good stuff? Turns out those weren't as bad as I was afraid they were going to be. Um, but that's kind of how I approached it. it. From a personal perspective, yes, we got sort of into the background of the words. Another book uh, that also, if any of you are familiar with William Sloan Coffin, Coffin was the uh, pastor. Well, he was. Remember Doonesbury, the guy, uh, the pa the Reverend with the beard, uh, is based on William Sloan Coffin. Uh, Coffin was later. He was the chaplain at Yale, and then he was uh, pastor at Riverside Christian Church, our Riverside Church, um, in New York City. And the other one that I kind of utilized a bit is called The Substance of Faith by Clarence Jordan. Um, and if you're not familiar with Clarence Jordan, Clarence Jordan formed a, a farm commune that he integrated in South Georgia back in the 50s. They were firebombed, they were shot at, uh, many, many terrible things, but they integrated as a faith community. And the very title of the book, The Substance of Faith, is sort of, part of if I'd taken on that next word that I didn't finish. So um, those three books are, are ones. That, anyway, thank you all. I appreciate y'all coming. Uh, I hope it wasn't too personal because you probably thought it was going to be something else. But it was what I was ready to do. <laughs> that was good.